my talk is called Being Young, Gifted, and Other Adjectives. It's a term in the black community. If you're an overachiever, they like to call you young, gifted, and black. But I realized black is not how I perceive myself. I'm a lot of other adjectives, and like we all are. Black is usually how people perceive me when they first run into me. And then they have to get to know me and realize I'm way more than that. So it doesn't define me. So um, my company's called Fairchild Consortium. We're a creative studio. We build almost everything, or we're trying to. We're trying to change the world. That's what we really want to do, change the world. Um, this is my talk, and my talk is about being young, gifted, and other adjectives. I'm going to use, this is my subject matter. It's Kanye West, one of the most polarizing entertainers of all time. And at the end of the day, he's very gifted. He was young, and he's a lot of adjectives we all apply to him. So I'm going to use him as the visual subject matter. And these are all his albums and how he's changed over the years. Because your adjectives come and go as you grow and develop and learn and everything else. So without further ado, let's start. Young. When you're young and you're a black game developer or any entertainment industry, you're usually the mascot. You're the one that everybody wants to pull up under their wing and talk to and show you the ropes. Uh, one of the terms we like to coin in specifically film and television is rabbi. Rabbi is the person that's older than you, well off, well intentioned, and they pull you under their ring and they show you all the ropes and the loopholes and introduce you to the people that you need to know. So young. The next one is gifted. You learn everything, and you are just you have this natural talent to just do things. For Kanye, it was music. For me, it was always computer science, learning, reading, uh, and talking. Um, something that we both have in common, but differently. Studious. And that goes with learning, where you have to be an avid learner. And being black, when you're hired into a company, they want to make sure. They ask you, what are your talents? What are your skills? The first thing I always say is, I'm the best learner you'll ever meet. Anything you throw at me, I'm going to learn about it and be the best at it. Um, I thank my dad for that. Unique. Usually you fit a quota. And when you go into the quota, you realize that there's other people like you there, maybe one or two. And you realize they're unique. They're all superstars in my case. Whenever, whenever I go into the game industry and I meet other black people, they're a designer, tech artist. They're a programmer, tech artist, designer. They're a producer, tech artist, designer. They are the unicorn in the room. And they have to have all these facets to even get hired. They can't just come in as a programmer. They can't just come in as a producer. That's my position as a producer. But I do have design skill. I can do a little bit of tech art. I can do a little bit of uh, drawing. I can sculpt a little bit for models. And I can speak everybody's language. Um, so you have to be somewhat unique. The next one is industrious. You have to work harder than everybody else. For some reason, if you make a mistake or you don't work as hard, it's put under a microscope and people can easily see you. And that's an issue. And so in the industry, they, they hire you because they know you're talented. Then they see you have these overabundance of skills, and you're hired for one position. But they want you to use all your skills for all positions. So you have to be industrious. And you have to always rise to the top of any challenge they throw at you. A methodical. Uh, in order to be industrious, you have to think about what you're doing and prioritize. Uh, being very methodical is, for example, as being a black tech professional or just a minority is after you have a conversation with somebody in a room, you methodically summarize it in an email because if it comes back up, you need something to defend yourself with. And you always put on the back of it, if there's any other further notes or you disagree with anything, please respond back to this email. And it usually hardly ever happens. But being methodical of how you're going to do things, you're faced with two tasks, and they're from two different people. You actually go talk to them and think of a method of completing both tasks and tell them what's going to get sacrificed for the other one to get done at a particular time, on time, or first. Focused. That goes with being methodical. You always are focused on the end goal, and you're always focused on yourself and how you look when you're presenting the end goal to people. Uh, the worst thing that ever happens to young black men is always being known as angry. The angry black male comes up anytime there is a voice of dissent, and he happens to be that voice. So you have to be very focused on what you're doing. 
Another one is daring. They want you to be bold and they want you to step out. You're the one that you're the outlier. So as the outlier, you can do a little bit more. You can present a different perspective. But also in being daring, they want you to be loyal. They want you to actually present your voice, but be willing to go with something else, to go with the creative director. Um, sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. For example, if you see a trope or a stereotype presented in a game or a form of entertainment, you can be the voice of dissent, but they're like, oh, that's what everybody wants to see, that's what everybody's used to, let's go with it. You can continually, your loyalty is as strong as you being able to help change their minds to make a better decision. Loyalty is not always following behind them, but actually getting them into the right direction. So for me, I always used, um, we call it a forced feedback. And it's where you're able to talk to people in the form of questioning. It's an inquisition. It's truly, truly an inquisition. Why are we making this choice? Does this choice sit right with you? Why does the public have to see it this way? And keep drilling them with questions to the point they realize it's stupid. And they should just see it your way. And, it's, and you're trying to get them to arrive to the solution that you came to. Because people are help, holding on to their perceptions of life. Everybody likes to be in their bubble, and occasionally their bubble needs to be popped. And that's where loyalty comes in. And when you tell them, you do it out of love. Uh, outspoken. That goes with forced feedback as well. So you have to be very outspoken um, about anything that you see is wrong, even if it doesn't concern you. So if somebody makes something that se says something sexist, you speak up about it. If you want them to be inclusive and be mindful of what they're doing. A lot of people do mindless acts around the office and within studios in particular. Uh, video games suffers from a slight Peter Pan syndrome. We all think we're 15 until we have to get paid. And then we want to act like adults and fight at each other. But before that, we think it's all fun and games and we can make any types of jokes or make any assumptions about people in the office. Uh, one in particular, I had a young lady that worked with us and we worked on, we were playing Titanfall at home. This is what we're doing in our, in our personal lives, sharing with one another as, as a team. And one of the guys said, I didn't imagine you being so good at first person shooters to her. And his whole perception was based because she's a female. What he didn't realize is that she's a professional first-person shooter player, and she's, she's just the stuff. She's just really, really good. And so when that happened, what I did was, let's, let's put a bet out there who would get the highest score tonight. And I put a, her name up there and his name, and I told everybody to, to decide on who's going to win, and we'll do odds from there. And nobody sided on him, so we couldn't really do the bet. There's no way he could win, but we really, I really wanted to do the bet. And I was like, "Huh, it's funny that nobody thinks you're even good at first-person shooters, so what does that say about you? I did it in jest, but it was, she took offense to it, and I saw it. Like, I can't imagine you being good at first-person shooters. I mean, I don't even know what that means, and she didn't really know what that means, considering she's been playing them all her life. Uh, strong. And that's just standing up for yourself, standing up for the people that are not represented in the room. And standing up for your team. And that is defending them and holding on to the values that are very important that are actually overshadow everything else you're working on. At the end of the day, we're going to present a project, a product or service to the world, and they get the judges on it. And you want to make sure that the judgment is fair and it's just. And so the, you have to be strong. You have to be strong against your superiors. You have to be strong with your inferiors. You have to be strong against your inferiors. And it's sad that we say superior and inferiors, but that's just the, in the pecking order of the studio that exists. Even in flat design or flat levels, there's still a pecking order because somebody can say something to somebody else and get them fired. And so that lets us know there's always a pecking order. No studio is ever fully flat, but it takes somebody to talk to somebody that can actually get them fired and be stand up strong against them when they think they're right. Uh, scrappy, and that's fighting. Um, you have to fight. Uh, this is a good picture of Kanye and Beyonce. It's from my personal collection. He loves Connect Four, and she does too. And to watch them play it is like them fighting. Like, they don't talk to each other. They don't even look at each other. Occasionally, they may smile, and they take it really serious. And they scrappy about it to the very last pieces in. They'll try their best to, even if, if they don't win, it's coming to a draw. 
And you, so you always have to fight. You have to fight for your position. You got to fight for who you are in the studio. Because some people want you to be who they think you should be and not who you really are. So you have to be very scrappy. Uh, gentle. It's hard to be scrappy and gentle at the same time. But you have to deliver information in a way that people can consume it. And so you have to be somewhat gentle. I tell everybody, uh, for me, the trigger for a studio as a black person is that he's always mad. And I'm usually the canary. I'm the producer that's canary. Like, why are we doing that? You know how much time that takes? How long that's going to take for us to do? How expensive that is? Why are we doing that? Why will we make this sergeant we can make two minions to give us the same impact in the game? And, but I have to do it in a very gentle way. I'm, very, I'm already outspoken, so I have to be gentle. I've, I'm going to deliver information. So I try to do everything for, with a smile. And the, uh, the terms that one of my bosses used for me a long time ago is like, you deliver shitty work to people always with a smile, and I think that's why they take it. Uh, cocky. This is an attribute of being a black male. Every now and then you have to be cocky. I mean, we see it with President Obama. Every time he says something that is considered colored language, and that means urban, that can mean black, that can be something not particularly standard in suburban white America. They think he's cocky whenever he says it. Um, everybody loved the fact when he said, you know, that they should be happy I can't run again. I already won twice. You know, everybody loved that comment. It's a point of being cocky sometimes. And you're not just cocky for yourself. I mean, working in uh, published games is funny when you're around the publisher and you want to be cocky for your team. So I tell everybody, we're going to walk into this meet and crip walk around the, the boardroom and get our checks and go home. And that's usually, and my team will laugh about it, but that, when you go in the room, you actually like, you need to pay us for our milestone. We deliver what we said we're going to deliver. We need the milestone money to keep moving. Your idea was wrong. Our idea, idea was right. But sometimes you, it's nice to be cocky, and the team can depend on you when you're that. But when you're talking to the publisher, you have to be charming as well, because you want them to continually pay you. So you have to be charming. You have to even be charming with your, your team. You have to go over to everybody, say good morning. You ask them about their families and they have any problems. Uh, being the producer on the project, you literally have to know what's going on in everybody's life. Because the artist will fight with a, an engineer about getting something into a game or getting a tool or getting some functionality down with a designer. And something personal could be happening at home that triggers them. And sometimes in studios, triggers can mean almost going to a fist fight. I've been in that room, too, where it almost led into a fist fight. But you have to be able to know what's going on. So when somebody storms over to somebody's desk and snaps at them, you can step in, pull them to the side and say, tell them to chill. You don't divulge that personal information, but you tell them today's not the day. You know, um, to know that I've had a lead on a project who was dealing with the son that could potentially die and him bearing all that weight and him snapping at people. We knew that was the case, but I would go behind and reaffirm what he told them in a very charming way. So the charm doesn't just happen for you to get what you want, but it's also to soften the way other people talk to other people in the office. And that's very, very important as a producer that you know, your tech artist may not have the social skills to deliver his message in a very soft and digestible way to a 3D artist, to a, a modeler. But I can come in and go behind and say, I know, I know what he said, you know, but don't take it a personal offense. But just get this done, and I'll talk to him about adjusting the timetable. And that's, you have to be very charming. And that leads you to be charismatic. Because not only are you trying to convince somebody to take instructions from somebody else who they don't even see as equals sometimes. You have to push everybody towards the go. And charisma goes a long way with that. You know, charming and charisma are two different things, and people don't realize that. Charm is like being happy and upbeat about things. And I've always been under the instruction, it's going to get done. It may not get done when you want it to get done, but it's going to get done. And I'll tell you when it's going to get done. And that goes to expectation management. Charismatic is, you know, managing everybody's expectations. And for a lot of people in the frat culture of video games, when people look alike, they allow, they don't have to have be as charismatic, but when you're an outlier, you have to be very charismatic to everybody in the group. And the group doesn't, it's not just a racial dynamic, it's a departmental dynamic. 
You know, you have to be charismatic with your modelers. You have to be charismatic with your your uh, your uh, riggers and your tech artists. And you have to be charismatic with the engineering team. And Lord knows, don't piss off the engineering team because nothing will get done if you piss off the engineering team. You know, at the end of the day, they actually have the, they hold the project in their hands. And Lord knows, don't allow the design team just to run rampant and just want to create things and not talk to an engineering team. So you have to corral the design team like they're cats, and you got to keep the engineering team happy at the same time. It's sort of like having two focal points where one tree is in front of the other, and you have to get that spot in the middle. Like it was said earlier, it's exactly just like that. And just so happened one tree is green and the other tree is dying at all times. And it switches every other minute. And you have to take care of all of it. Uh, be fruitful while we're talking about trees. Um, you have to make sure you produce. As a person of color or a female or people that have different gender assignments or alignments, you have to be fruitful because people take your personal attributes and judge your work on it. It's totally unfair, but nobody said life would ever be fair. But you always have to be aware that, oh, Charles is late because he's black. You know, they may not say it, they think it. So I'm always on time. Besides, I went to Morehouse College, and being late was unacceptable. And, and, and being on time was being late, so you're always early. So you have to be fruitful. You always have to present something good and strong. And it's delicious for everybody to digest, especially when you're talking to a publisher. So when I'm walking in a room with a 68-year-old white male, and he sees me sit down, and I'm very confident, and he's ready to try to cut my milestone payment as quick as possible, I make sure he can't. I bring up emails. I, I make sure I manage his expectations to the point where we're always over-delivering. And I keep a level of facelessness to him that he doesn't see the rest of my team. And when he feels like he needs to be ballsy, I'll step back and let him be ballsy. Uh, ballsy is a term of he feels like he has to showboat in the room. And sometimes you have to let people do that. Um, I don't take it as a point of attacking my pride. And even though I'm very prideful and it was built, in me, built into me to be prideful, coming from a predominantly white neighborhood and being the first black family in that whole subdivision, I, my parents built in pride, but sometimes it's easier to step back and let them vent and get it out of them. And it's not personal. It's just business for them. And you just have to be faceless. And you have to present your team as a faceless entity. We're just a line item on a larger publisher's budget, and they can cut us at any given time. So after I showboat and tell them what we're delivering and manage their expectations, they have to feel like they have to win something before they leave the meeting. That's when I become faceless. And they want you to be faceless. Uh, um, we live in a game, we're in a game industry where they, they want everybody to act as kings, but they want to give no one the crown. They want you to be the best, but they're never going to tell you that. They want you to be better. They want you to be better than the best that they already have working for them. Um, I worked for a boss, and I've heard him cuss out his boss in the gaming industry. And, it, and he was all remained faceless until there was an attack on his team. And I learned that from him. I've never heard somebody say the word fuck in so many different versions. Within a paragraph, I think it was every other word, him blowing up, his, blowing up on his boss with us in the room, with some of us in the room, about because he questioned, his boss questioned the work of the team. And we were definitely the best studio they had working for them. And so he was faceless, and he, he ate some things, but when it hit that, that was a trigger for him. And you have to remain faceless sometimes. It, it sucks. People of color like the, the hate microaggressions, and sometimes you have to eat them. I hate to say it, but sometimes you have to eat them for the sake of your team. Your team is more important than your own personal feelings. You know, you want everybody on your team to have a good Christmas. And the last thing you want to do is something personally, how you feel about something, to destroy the relationship of that team and destroy that team. So unfortunately, you have to be faceless sometimes. And I hate to harp on it, but we always want to push out against it. Because at the end of the day, you're winning. You let them win that battle. You're winning. You know, you get to go back to your team and say we're all getting paid and we're moving forward. And your son and your daughter can have that bicycle. You can buy that iPad for them. And you want everybody to be happy. And you want yourself to be happy. So uh, a temporary loss.
can be a long-term gain. People that lift weights saying that your muscles are sore because your body's releasing weakness. And sometimes you just have to release some of the, the, the weakness you feel about your pride or other things because it leads to long-term happiness. Because the goal is to get a product and service out to the world and they can love and appreciate and showcase who you are. And at all times, you have to work harder, better, faster, and stronger as any type of minority in a room of people that don't necessarily understand everything about you on face value. And that's it. Any questions from anybody? I put all my information up there in case anybody wants pictures. You can follow me on everything. Okay? <laughs>